life is about places. I mean, the most important one for me is London. I was born in London, I've lived in London, I'm a townie, I love London. I think being an architect is possibly one of the best things you can be because it is creative um, in a way. Writing is creative as well, but architecture, producing a building. And believe me, when you walk round a building that has been completed, doesn't matter whether it's a small extension or a big, big, important building, as an architect, you're 10 feet tall. Why? Because it started as a blank sheet of paper and you created it. When I first decided I wanted to be an architect, I was very lucky. I, that decision was made when I was 13. At 13, I knew exactly um, what I wanted to be in life. I'm an old boy at Peckham School for Girls, which always caused great hilarity among my daughters. And I would point out and say, that's my old school. The headmistress of that school was a ferocious uh, Irish lady called Miss O'Reilly but very, very sensible. And of course, she put me in for the technical scholarship, which is a thing that you then did when you were 12. And I passed that. And so my mother and I were, uh, were interviewed by, what, 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 what did I want to do? And of course, I said, I want to design aeroplanes, Spitfires. Oh, she said, we'll put you down for the engineering school at Lewisham. She said, but you must have a second choice second choice. So I said, well, I haven't got a second choice. She said, well, we'll put you down for building. What I didn't know was even in February 1942, that, that's when it was, um, the government, even then, were thinking about post-war reconstruction. There'd be a lot of engineers, but construction, building, wouldn't be, be, be the important thing. And so, of course, in April 1942, I found myself at the School of Building Brixton on a junior, three-year junior course, age 13. And within three months of being at the School of Building, I was still mad on aeroplanes. I still loved the Spitfire, but I was going to be an architect. For the first year, you had literally one day a week in workshops. So you lay bricks, plastered walls, um, made lead joints, and chipped away at masonry. And that is most important because architecture is, uh, is a practical art. Yes, it's creative, and you're creating something you hope that is beautiful and will be admired, but it's got to work. So I got a job in a, an architect's office. Uh, I was only 16. Rego Closiers, a big factory in Tottenham, had been burnt down and they got a license, a building license, to rebuild it uh, in 1945, before the war had even finished. And of course, I was given the job of doing all the drawings. Boy, did I learn fast. I started uh, at Westminster, well, the, it was the Regent Street Polytechnic in those days, now it's Westminster University. I started at their evening school of architecture where you went three evenings a week, did one year, uh, and then I was called up. I then had, well, two year break, 20 months in the army. But when I came out, the RIBA had special concessions for uh, returning servicemen who'd fought for king and country. And they applied to me as well because I was under the conscription. So I didn't have to do all the painful testimonies of study. So I sat uh, in the RIBA building in the Florence Hall. I sat the intermediate exam externally at the end of the second year and passed. So of course I went to the head of uh, uh, Regent Street Poly School of Architecture and said, aren't I a clever boy? I passed the examination at the end and said, will you put me up to the fifth year? Fifth year? And he said, no way. He said, you're here to learn architecture, not to learn how to pass examinations. There was no way. I just saved the two years that I'd lost in the army. And so I then transferred back. The Brixton School of Building had an evening school of architecture as well at the same time. So I went back to the Brixton School of Building, the evening school of architecture. And then I did the final examination externally, again in the Florence Hall here in this building. I know exactly where I sat. And I passed that in 1952. By then, I was already beginning to get work of my own. Um, uh, one or two private, sort of private jobs, very small, but that was the beginning. And so by 1954, 
uh, I really decided I had to sit the what was then a professional practice uh, exam. I sat that, passed that, uh, and so in 1954 uh, I came galloping through the front doors of this building with my two, two guinea check in my grubby little hand uh, to sign on as a, a probationer, which you, you could do so. So I was then a student, RIBA, appeared in the, in, in, the, in, in the members' book that they used to publish. And of course then, once I passed the final exam, I again came galloping through the front doors uh, and I was elected. I wanted to be a member of the RIBA, A, because I felt very proud of the fact that I'd made it. Um, but also, I could have those magic words behind my title, and I was already beginning to work, do private work. Um, a R I B A, so should the R I B A. Owen Luda. I dropped the Harold, which is my first name, uh, and I just became Owen. Even before I'd qualified, I'd always quite clearly wanted to work for myself. I wanted to build up my own practice, do my own thing. In the mid 50s, I found myself king of the ladies' hairdressing salons. The interesting thing about my career is so many times I've found myself uh, designing buildings that were being were in, a, in a, a, an area that were of change, of dramatic change, and I had to be part of the process of, of changing the whole approach to design. And of course, ladies' hairdressing salon in salons in the mid-1950s uh, were Mr. Teasy Wheezy, Vidal Sassoon were just beginning to make a name for himself, but the whole pattern of hairdressing was changing from ladies um, in nasty smelling things on their head, hiding behind uh, curtains in cubicles, a very secretive affair that men, of course, were banished from. You didn't go into a ladies' hairdressing salon. And, of course, I then started designing ladies' hairdressing salons as interior design. And I designed Vidal Sassoon's first big salon in Bond Street. But unfortunately, we didn't get the job. And uh, his contractor effectively built my design. Today, I would have sued him for breach of copyright, but in those days, get on, move on. As we got to the back end of the 1950s, I got in, started getting involved in commercial development. Architects were too posh, too aloof, too professional. They didn't want to get involved with developers. I was introduced to Alec Coleman, and from then on, of course, the relationship I had with him, we built a whole millions of pounds worth of work developments, which were epoch-making, where they were iconic buildings. When I was introduced to Alec Coleman, uh, the first thing he got me to do, he phoned me a few days later and said, Owen, will you go to Leicester? I've got a site offered to me in Leicester uh, for offices on the ring road. Will you go and have a look, tell me what I can do with it? And so I went and had a look at it, came back and said, Alec, or Mr. Coleman, I wasn't on the Alec terms in those days, Mr. Coleman, I said, I can get you 100,000 square feet on that site. It's a great site, it's right on the ring road. But who's going to take 100,000 square feet of offices in Leicester? The only person that has built, has built 30,000 square feet, which he left to the government. And Alec Coleman said to me, Owen, he said, you're the first architect that's ever told me not to build something. From that moment on, the relationship I had with Alec Coleman was absolutely, really quite magical. I was interviewed by the Architects Journal, and they said to me, Owen, you've lived and practiced during pretty well every boom and bust since the war, and you seem to have survived and prospered. How do you do it? So I said, well, do you want an article, or do you want two words, three words, two, three words? And they said, well, we need the article, what are three words? I said, keep ahead of the game. I said, you have got to anticipate what is happening, what the trends are, what the pressures are for change, and then, design according to change. And that's what happened um, with, certainly with the, well, happened with that ladies' hairdressing salon, but it also happened with, um, for example, shopping centres. My view was that a shopping centre was like a fairground. All the individual shopkeepers got to shout their wares. That was what it was on. That's the success of it. That's the success of a market. And so I'd said, no, whatever the shopkeepers want to do in their shop fronts, they can do it. No control at all but within this very, very strong framework of the concrete main structure. The interesting thing was that uh, a guy that wrote New Buildings of Britain in 1967, uh, he illustrated Tricorn and also Gateshead, and Eros House Catford, which is the one I got the RIBA bronze medal for, which really put me on the map as an architect. And he said that the great success of Owen Luder is that he combines this plasticity in the use of design and concrete 
which at times is quite mannerist, in other words, it's a bit forced, but combines it with an instinctive understanding of how commercial development works. When you start a project, when you're first appointed, or you first start designing it, even maybe before you're appointed, you have a sheet of blank sheet of white paper. And the only thing you have is, an arch is a client's brief. In the case of those shopping centres, I didn't have a client's brief. I wrote the brief myself. Brutalist was used as a derogative word. In the end, concrete was used as a derogative word. I mean, I did a shopping centre in Bath, which didn't have any concrete inside anywhere. It's all Bath stone. A mo very modern design, admittedly, but nevertheless. And it was still called a concrete monstrosity. The BBC or newspapers would have, comp you know, straw polls with their readers or their viewers as to what is the most ugliest building, and Tricor would always be on the list. The BBC did a programme called Demolition, and so they did film pieces on each of six buildings. I did the one with Kevin MacLeod in Gateshead. The woman producer said to me, he said, Owen, ask Kevin what he thinks. And you can see the piece of television film. Kevin looked up at the building and said, of all of these six, this is the one that should be kept. I built up a team of young architects, all thinking as I did. I never had to advertise to staff. These young architects would come and say, can we come and work for you, Mr. Luda? Please, um, you know, because you're building that team up. So you had a team. And of course, all big building, big developments are teamwork. I mean, you, you may be at the top and you may determine the policy and you may, determine, you may do the conceptual design, but in the end, if it's a big scheme, other people are involved, it's a teamwork. When the commercial development uh, market uh, collapsed, with the economy started collapsing uh, in the back end of, well, the second half of the 1960s, it's when I then moved out of, quite deliberately, uh, changed my emphasis away from commercial development into other buildings and started designing a lot of public sector buildings. From then on, of course, we did a whole string of high security prisons. We did um, the Durham one. We did Full Sutton in York. Um, and then, of course, having done the, the, uh, the Durham prison, interesting, the PSA phoned me and said, I mean, we've got, a prison, we've got to build a prison very, very quickly over, over the water. And the moment they said over the water, I knew exactly where they meant in Northern Ireland. And so they said, but it, it's very straightforward. We'd like you to do it. Uh, all you have to do is use the, the, um, uh, use the plans for the Durham prison. But of course, what they'd overlooked was not only with all the levels all over the place, the orientation was different. I mean, and in the end, we really redesigned it. And the prison design was, I couldn't influence it. They were, we were just, it was just a case of getting them built. Having said that, Franklin Prison in Durham has got a lovely piece of brick sculpture outside. And one of my friends, because it was always coming up on, on television because it was, where they have a high security wing in a Category B prison. High and the high security ring, ring of course, had all the, 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 the RAO terrorists. And, uh, of course, they were always concerned about... And so uh, they, I said, how did you manage to persuade them to, to spend that money on that brick sculpture outside the main entrance? I said, it isn't a brick sculpture, it's an anti-tank trap. Uh, 1975, the economy collapsed in a big way very big way. Secondary banks were going bust, developers were going bust. The workload here was, um, in this country, in the UK, uh, was getting very, very difficult. I was very fortunate. I'd got the high security prisons, which was providing fee income, and I also have been appointed for the Vale of Beaver coal mining, which is suddenly getting involved in pushing out the frontiers of coal mines, not, not underground, but on all the surface. Uh, but I just sensed that the opportunity was abroad. We'd had the oil price explosion. Suddenly the Middle East was awash with money and things. And so I decided that uh, I would go abroad. We did a lot of work in Saudi Arabia. We did the city hall in Taif, which is the summer capital in the late summer. Uh, we did the Ministry of Agricultural building in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia was very successful. Nigeria, we did the National Stadium. The other one was Iran. I had a very good friend called Paris, Paris Moedi, 
who was Iranian, but had worked over here for years, and I met him and we worked together. He'd worked for me, I'd worked for him. And he had very big connections, this is in the days of the Shah, he had very big connections in Iran. And, uh, and he said, well, if you're going to over there, I'll, I'll take you over and give you the introductions. And so he flew me over there, and sure enough, uh, and I sent one of my guys out there to open a, an office. Um, but Iran, even under the Shah, you knew if you picked the phone up, somebody was listening at the other end. So, so we used to do all sorts of strange uh, messages, you know, just to confuse them. Also, he, he did, in fact, uh, Paris, said my uncle, his uncle, he said is, is, uh, is chief of the Iran police. What he didn't tell me was he was also deputy chief of the Sarvak, the secret police. And he was a general and, and Paris said to me, he said, you know, you're doing high security prisons. He said, they got a program for high security prisons in, in Iran. He said, um, uh, he said you, you know, the, the, you, you really ought to get in on it. He said, meet my, my uncle. So his uncle came over, quite a small man, and we had dinner uh, with him in an Iranian restaurant in Kensington with Paris and very, very pleasant. And he was over here because his daughter was over here having medical treatment. And he said to me at the end of it, he said, oh, and he said, you must come and see me. Uh, next time you're in Tehran, come and see me. We're talking about high security prisons. And he gave me his card and he said, uh, the address is the Ivan, Ivan prison. He said, the, the taxi driver will be very nervous. He said, he'll only drop you at the front door. And so I thought, yeah, okay. So I, I, next time, I, I brought my next trip to, around forward a bit, and I went out there, and the taxi driver dropped me outside the, 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 the front entrance of the Ivan prison, and I was ushered in, the doors clanged behind me, and I walked through, and then I found, I was taken to his office. Uh, he was quite a little man, but he was sitting on a podium behind his desk, with big epaulets and a, and we chatted like anything, um, you know, for one. Then he said, well, okay, he said, the first one, he said, uh, I mean, we, uh, said, we will appoint you for one. He said, we've got one coming up. He said, um, uh, we'll have to talk about it. And I said to him, by then I was thinking, do I want to design high security prisons in Iran? And so I said to him, I'll have to get government clearance because we, you signed the Official Secrets Act where you design prisons. And I said, I'll have to get my government clearance and I can do it because of the official secret there. Knowing full well, I didn't actually have to. And as I walked out and those doors clanged behind me, I thought, no, I don't think I want to buy. One of the most interesting overseas things was Little Rock, Arkansas. And I met some very influential people in, uh, in, in Arkansas, the Baileys, and they wanted me to go out and help them. So I, in fact, went to Little Rock, Arkansas, and I advised them on their uh, redevelopment of downtown Little Rock. Uh, I did advise them to keep the railway station, because there was the railway station, the, the Rock Island line, uh, all empty. And to me, I could see all the big American uh, uh, steam engines there uh, and I said you must keep it but they didn't but the interesting thing was of course one they made me uh, a freeman of the state of Arkansas so I'm a freeman of the city of London and a freeman of the state of Arkansas um, but also uh, as I was leaving he said oh they're going to fly a flag over the capital in Washington today in your honor and he said they will send it to you sure enough two or three weeks later the flag arrived with the certificate signed and it had been flown over Washington in 1965, I think, I made my approach to the RBA and said, look, I'd like to get involved, you know, put me on a committee. I wanted to go on the Public Affairs Committee because public relations, uh, media, that, I, I reckon I knew a bit about that, even, even at that stage. By then, of course, I was also beginning to shout my head off and say, look, hang on, uh, the way education is being run, the way particularly practice, it's out of date. We're, we're still operating as though we're Victorian professionals, and we're not. It's a different world. So, of course, I began to get a name. I'd already got a name architecturally, which helped enormously, but I began to get a name for arguing um, about uh, change, the, RIB, the way the profession should change running itself. Anyway, I stood for Council 67 and got on. And, of course, I was then the, the troublemaker, the backbencher, the one shouting the odds, and. I didn't get anywhere. I mean, I was not considered to be part of the thing. I was, I, was an, I was one of the awkward squad. There weren't many of them in those days. 
I'd never had any aspiration to be president until Gordon Graham refused to have me as his uh, uh, vice president when he was his second year as, as president. And that's when I decided, not this, I would stand for president. I mean, I just went on a publicity campaign, meeting members in, in regional meetings and in publicity. And of course, in the end, I, um, I won with more than 56% of the votes. Ian Leslie, who was the editor of Building Magazine, who was my mentor and got me writing as a columnist, he said, I was talking to two architect knights, Lord Isher and uh, Freddie Gibbs, Sir Freddie Gibbard, and we were talking about the younger architects coming up who might be presidents. He said, I mentioned your name. He said, and they both said, oh no, he didn't go to the right school. <laughs> you know, I, I just broke a mould here, which, um, and of course I had a very successful first presidency. I, I, I can say that because the, the facts are, I was seen by some of the public sector architects as the real ogre. <laughs> to the right of Igus Khan, and I wasn't like that at all. Yes, it was, uh, I enjoyed it most of the time. The second presidency was more difficult, uh, and I must admit, on one or two occasions in the second uh, presidency, which is 13 years later, I did occasionally sit there and think, what the hell am I doing this job for? I'm not even getting paid for it. Michael Hesseltine, who I knew quite well, and he was the environment minister at the time, and he approached me, he said he wanted to do a, uh, an architect developer competition for it, so I helped him set it up. And then I was invited to the private view of the exhibition at the National Gallery of the seven shortlisted schemes. And I should have known better, but the, edit, the architectural correspondent of the Times came sidling up to me and said, Owen, what do you think about these um, shortlisted schemes? And I said, well, you know, that one, that's a state set for Romeo and Juliet. And that, 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 those are commercial development. Um, that one's quite good. But Richard Rogers is the only scheme that, are, that has sort of said, well, that's what I think the answer is. And so it, it, you know, take it or leave it, which perfectly justified. But of course, that created a hiatus. I mean, an RIBA president using the word sod um, in those days was uh, uh, really was none. And as a result, Prince Charles became interested. And the net result was when the final scheme, which was not Richard Rogers, was B B uh, BHK, when their scheme, which was a revised scheme, when that was published, that was the one that Prince Charles, of course, calls, uh, described as the carbuncle. Uh, of course, in 1981-82, uh, Mrs. Thatcher had, was the Prime Minister and was in the middle of a, an economic crisis. And of course, the construction industry was in a very bad way. We had a construction industry group called then, the, the Group of Eight, which was eight representatives right across the board, the whole of the industry. Uh, trade unions, con contractors, subcontractors, and of course, the professionals, which in fact, I was the, as the president of the RIBA, uh, I was accepted as the chairman of the, of the construction industry group. Michael Hesseltine arranged a meeting with the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Sir Geoffrey Howe. He entertained us at number 11 in uh, soft, soft seat sofas and deep pile carpets, and we got absolutely nowhere. And so I said to Patrick Harrison, who was the secretary then at the RIBA in charge, and I said, what do we do? And he said, you should meet Mrs. Thatcher, the Prime Minister. I'd already warned the construction industry that she would, as we were trade unions on one side, uh, con the contractors on the other, that she would try to split us up. And of course, that's exactly what she did. Um, and I, she, she was attacking to the, 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 the unions, trying to get us on that line. And I waited for her to take a breath, and I just said, sorry, Prime Minister, it's not like that. And there was a deathly hush. And of course, uh, uh, when I went to a reception at 10 Downing Street three or four weeks later, she wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> but I've always worked on the basis that A, I don't hold um, grudges. If something's happened in the past, that's history. And so I've always tried to be as friendly as possible. In my commercial development days, um, Alec Coleman's sidekick, side man, uh, John, Jack Houtman, uh, used to say to me, oh, and he said, you come to every meeting 10 minutes late, he said, you come in there with a grin, crack a joke, he said, and everybody's eating out of your hand. I, I, it's just one of my, I suppose it, you know, it's a personality, you have a personality. I don't, I don't play the personality, that's just, just me. I am always friendly, no reason, why not be friendly? Friends with everybody.
very often I've got out of difficult situations by a grin and a joke and so uh, whereas if you go in you know with your your knuckles gripped and you're gonna have a fight you'll have a fight I love everybody until I've discovered that the reason why I shouldn't love them <laughs> or shouldn't like them one of the things of course is I enjoy life and you project that enjoyment of life and that's part of the personality but that's just me I mean I don't I've never developed that it's just me it's the way I am for good or bad most people I suppose would look at my career and say well for what more could you expect? Uh, I had a great career. Um, I started with nothing, and I have considerably more than nothing now. So uh, from the point of view of professional reputation, um, somebody once said to me, after Foster and Rogers, you're probably the best known architect in the land. Of course, I was born in Islington. At least I thought I was born in Islington, but I wasn't. I was born in uh, in the hospital near Paddington, West London. Um, I never really thought about it until I checked up much later and found suddenly that my birth certificate was um, uh, was registered in Harrow Road. I couldn't understand it, but equally well, of course, my birth certificate didn't have a father's name on it. When I discovered this, and then I became started becoming curious, understandably, I would ask my mother occasionally, uh, and also my grandmother. Neither of them would be forthcoming on it. They would both would clam up. I suspect that my mother was seduced by the boss's son, and that's how I come to be in photographs when I'm clearly only about two years old dressed up like little old Fauntleroy in a very, very well-kept garden by a very well-kept lady. So I think I was fostered for the first uh, three years. A single mum, single mother in 1928, and that was, that, you know, that's the reason I suspect why I was born away from Islington. I wasn't born in the family house, which is still there. To be illegitimate was something that, at the best, you were very uncomfortable with. That you felt it was a cross. You didn't want to own up to it. My mother was really quite a bit of a prude. So she, she must have been, in a way, seduced. And the only thing I know is that um, she met, when she met my uh, old man, I'm calling him the old man because that differentiates with her father. When she met him, he was working in Finsbury Square and she was working as, which is what's on the birth certificate, as a, a swimming costume presser. And she was working for a firm called Berliners, which would be the starting point if I wanted to really track it down. She was lucky she married Ted Luder. That's how the name Luda comes in, although my name is not actually Luda on the, on the dirt birth certificate, it's Mason, which was my grandmother's uh, name, the family name. So it didn't have any impact at all on my life in those early days, but later on, it was a cross I always felt I had to carry. We were living in Islington, but the old man, uh, he came from Penge, and so in no time at all, uh, by the time I was about five, six, uh, must have been six, We'd moved across into to South London. The mother, I said, I asked her several times, why did we move to South London? She, she used to use the thing, she said, well, in South London, the loos were inside the house. In North London, they were outside loos, and that wasn't very... And I can vaguely remember the outside loo, vaguely. You know, with, with, with all the things about an outside loo and the, the butcher's hook and the torn-up newspaper, all of that, I can remember. And that was... In you know, those days, people didn't buy toilet rolls, they just tore up the newspaper. I mean, quite incredible to know when you think. Uh, it just doesn't happen that way. But, of course, once we moved over to South London, then my grandmother eventually moved over um, and lived in South London close to us all the time. We moved to Rotherhithe, uh, down near the Surrey Docks. Um, and the uh, usual thing, two, two rooms and a kitchen up the upper part of a Victorian terrace house. And in the 30s, of course, um, the life, it, it, it's, I suppose people can't really understand what life would be. Um, you didn't have fridges. You put the milk out on the windowsill at night to keep it cool. And of course, you have milk delivered every day. In those days, of course, no such thing as central heating. 
all Victorian terrace houses had an open fire in the uh, in in all the rooms, and would have a, uh, an open fire with an oven in the kitchen in the kitchen room, um, and that's how the house was heated. You had a coalman who would come and deliver, and there would be a, a circular hole in the pavement outside, and he would come in. I used to be designated that when the coalman arrived, I used to have to count the sacks because it was known that some unscrupulous uh, coalman should have delivered seven sacks of coal, but in fact they only delivered six. And you could once, and they were just shot down the hole into the, into the, into the coal cellar. The very earliest, remember, is the, 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 the lamplighter coming round on horseback. And then he transferred to a bike, and he quickly mastered the business of uh, turning the, lights, the gas lights on without getting off the bike. <laughs> Public transport, the trams... I mean, the old man used to go on the workman's ticket. You had a workman's ticket for a penny that would take you almost anywhere in London on the tram. Well, if there was a death in the street, everybody's curtains would be drawn. And everybody would come out when the funeral would come out and bow and men always wore hats in those days, of course, would doff their hat. Of course, when we moved up, as we did just before the war, in 1938, to the old Kent Road, that really was, um, you know, if you grow up in the old Kent Road, um, you have to be streetwise, uh, you know, you learn, well, if you don't. Um, and uh, I suppose, in a way, that, that uh, developed in me a, 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 a sort of resilience, but it also delivered in me, I think, uh, without ever realising it, an ability to be able to judge people. You live in a rough and tough area. You would know that some of your neighbours might well be bank robbers going up West End robbing banks, but nobody, you didn't have to lock your front door in your own place. Nobody, you were absolutely safe. And if anybody stepped out of line, they would be on them. It, this is the sort of family, I suppose it's the Cockney family tradition where if your family, that's it. You, whatever the situation is, it's up to you to do whatever you can to help if they're family. And that's a famous co Cockney expression, but your family. When we played football in the street, and there was one house in the street that was the posh house, and of course I kicked the ball and broke a window. And of course I, I was then told to go and ask for the ball back. And of course the irate uh, owner of the house uh, took me by the ear with the ball, took me down to the house, knocked on the door and said to my old man, said, look what he's done. Now, the old man didn't say what might happen today. Uh, he just sort of said to me, you shouldn't have done that. He said, right, he will pay for the broken window. That's this week's pocket money. And what's more, I'll penalise him now. So he was a great disciplinarian without being over. So it was an ideal. And of course, I owe a tremendous amount to to the old man and, and also to my mother. Uh, my mother had a, uh, was a very shrewd, very shrewd in terms of money. She had her six little purses and one for the rent because, you know, the old man only earned an, an, a normal workman, workman's wage. Uh, we'd only had one child to bring up, so it wasn't too bad. We were never poverty stricken by any means, but she managed things superbly. She had her six little purses and she used to shop at the, the, the co-op to get the divvy. The divvy was the little tin checks that you then cashed in to your divvy book. And we, our first radio was bought from Co-op Divvy. I mean, a, a hard purchase wasn't thought of in those days. Uh, you, if you didn't, didn't afford something, you didn't buy it. The memory I have, because she was quite short, and in those days, if I misbehaved, I'd get a box around the ears. And then this day, she was just going to give me a box around the ears she realised I was taller than her, and so she didn't. <laughs> um, she was, I'd say, very organised, uh, very, very organised. Maybe that's where I get my, because I'm, by and large, a pretty organised person. I always have been. So maybe that's where I get it from. Um, uh, but she was, um, and she was very close to my grandmother, uh, who was a great lady. I mean, she really was. Real old Cockney. She used to play the Joanna in the pub. She, she used to sing all the Cockney songs. She lost her husband, who would have been my grandfather, in the First World War in 1916. And, of course, she was marvellous. I mean, she, brought, she worked in Bart's Hospital uh, in the path lab all her life. And uh, she used to take me on holidays 
and we would go on the train to All Hallows by the Sea, which was about the nearest um, seaside resort, or Sheerness. In actual fact, we went to Bognor once, which uh, and I, I can remember. And of course, in those days, if you were a kid, working class kid growing up in the in 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 sort of working class areas. Uh, no such thing as uh, package flights, no such thing as holidays or even package holidays. Uh, if you were lucky, you went on the paddle steamer down to South End. In those days, the City of London had made a sandy beach just by Tower Bridge, just inside the pool, and where you would go there on a, on a sunny afternoon and you would be on a beach on the river and Tower Bridge would be up and down all the time. Every now and again, the bell would go and the bridge would come up and ships would come through. Uh, and they did that because kids didn't go on holidays. Uh, I was industrious enough. I mean, I, I, I used to do a paper round. Uh, the paper round, um, I used to do a, a milk round during the war uh, with the milkman. And also I did a cat's meat round where you delivered cat's meat. Um, the, uh, in the Old Kent Road, just by the Tr Trafalgar Road, the Trafalgar Tavern, a, a guy with a the, used to sell horse meat, which was pet food, and I, I used I was delivery. So I always earned extra pocket money. Um, I, I suppose my first deal I ever did in life was that uh, when I was a, would have been about twelve, maybe thirteen, I'd saved up my pocket money and my earnings money, and I bought a bike for five shillings. But it was a pretty tatty old bike, didn't have mud guards um, and that. But I did it up and then within about 18 months, I sold it for 30 bob. From September the 7th, when the Blitz started, right through to end of April. I mean, it was a totally different life. But September the 7th, I mean, I can see it now. Um, I was playing up at a back garden on the Osry Road, fairly close by, with some friends. And we were playing in the garden. And uh, inevitably, the parents there had said, well, if the air raid warning goes, you go in the Andes shelter. We heard these planes coming, thinking it would be a squadron of Spitfires and Hurricanes, jumped on top of the Anderson shoulder so we could wave at them. But of course, when they came over, it was a squadron of Heinkel 111s, the German bombers, with, uh, escorted by ME 109s, flying very low. I could see because the, uh, the Heinkel 111 has got a very glass front and we could actually see the bomb aimer, aimer in the front. And of course, I mean, we all booted and everything else. And of course, the parents came out, get in the shoulder, get in the shoulder. So of course, we had to get in the shoulder. And I was doing it, uh, an evening newspaper round at that time. And in the evening, when it all stopped, I went up on the roof of a block of flats that I deliver papers. And I saw the whole of Docklands was absolutely alight. Second night of the Blitz, we're all sitting there. And suddenly we heard these three bombs screaming down. They talk screaming bombs, but they weren't. The bombs automatically made that noise, that's, that's, that whistling, screaming noise. We heard these three, and there were trem trem three tremendous thuds. And I remember the old man saying to me, well, that was pretty close. 5.30 in the morning, the warden comes round, banging on the front of the Anderson shelter, says, you've got to get an unexploded bomb. One of the bombs was in the next garden. Now, if it hadn't been unexploded... <laughs> um, I don't know, I saw people that came out of Anderson Shelters uh, that were twisted, but hadn't had direct hits, and they survived. So Anderson Shelters was a very, very, very safe shelter. I mean, unless it had a direct hit or literally run alongside. Uh, now, I wasn't scared. We then had to get out. We went and lived with my auntie, auntie Dillnot, auntie uh, Dillnot up in, in, uh, uh, up in Peckham, off Queen's Road, uh, while, we, while they were getting the bombs out. The only time I suppose I was scared would have been just after Christmas in 1940, just when St Paul's was nearly burnt down, and they dropped a Molotov cocktail. Molotov cocktails were big canisters with incendiary bombs, and they would open out about um, 100 feet above the ground and scatter these incendiary bombs. So there were incredible number of incendiary bomb fires going on, and it was a bright moonlight night, and so they really had target. And they set all the warehouses along the canal on fire, 
And the warden came down to the brick shelter we were in then and said, you're going to have to get out because the fires, we're, we're concerned that the fires are going to get out of control and, and come with wind in that direction. And I can remember now that coming out of that shelter and running, because we did, we ran up Osley Road, nearly tripping over all the, the, the hoses uh, with anti-aircraft guns going bang, bang, bang in the sky, incendiary bombs all over the place. Uh, and I suppose that that particular occasion, yes, suddenly you were conscious. And of course, one of my one of my cat's lives was uh, as a result of that, because we we went into a, all the shelters were occupied because everybody had been evacuated. There was no shelter space, so we. I can't remember how, how we managed, you know, why we went there or how it, how it happened, but we went into a house on Old Kent Road, by adding to back, which was an old, which was a Georgian house, beautiful house. And we sat with another family. We sat in that front room. And we're sitting under three beautiful, tall Georgian windows. Uh, and it was in those days, you were very often the front room and the back room classical layout, would have a folding petition. And we're sitting in the front room, and it was my mother said, and I can remember her saying, bit silly us sitting here. If anything happens, all that glass. And so we moved behind the screen. The men closed the folding screen, the folding petition, and we sat there. And at 20 past five in that morning, just as we were expecting the all clear to go, this one last German bomber came dropped a bomb and we thought it was in the front garden I mean it was very very close uh, in fact it was a couple of hundred yards down the road but the blast had taken all the glass out of those windows but it had sucked the folding doors outwards and the folding doors caught on that glass and they were absolutely sh we, if we'd have been sitting in that front we would have been cut to pieces all of us my grandmother had been working for Bart's, Bartholomew's Hospital. They'd been evacuated to uh, Hill End, just outside St Albans. And uh, she used to come up at weekends. She had rooms in uh, Rotherhithe. But if she didn't come up, she would get me to go, to go over on my bike to make sure everything was all right. And of course, that Tuesday afternoon, I can remember it now, uh, I cycled down there. And of course, when I got to Gom Road, it was roped off. And the guy said, you can't come up here, laddie. And I said, but... And of course, the house was at, at, at a near miss, hadn't been a direct hit. But the couple uh, were, were sheltering under the staircase, which is the strongest part of the house, because it's a triangle. Uh, and they, in fact, had survived. They'd been injured, but they survived. Uh, but the house was just complete. She lost everything. You know, what we would do, I mean, I had a great friend uh, and in the morning we would meet up immediately after the blitz. We'd go around finding shrapnel. I've still got a piece of shrapnel. And we would get round where we weren't supposed to go, looking for parachute silk, because Molotov cocktails came down on the parachute. So did their other bombs where they had canister bombs, which just exploded as they hit the ground. And that was maximum blast. Um, and we would go around and I remember... There was a, we couldn't go down Glengall Road, so of course, being young lads, we knew our way round. We found our way round the back, and we went into this garden, and there's this um, <laughs> this, this uh, canister bomb uh, in the tree, swinging it. <laughs> now then, I don't say we were scared, but there we did scamper very quickly because we realised. Um, the other time, of course, was, which is really quite incredible because. Um, you had stirrup pumps, and the I mean, I've still got I've re bought the cigarette cards that I had before the war, which were air raid precautions. And one of the cigarette cards was stirrup pumps, and everybody, uh, you know, it was or a lot of people were issued with stirrup pumps and a bucket, and you had a bucket of water, bucket of sand, and a stirrup pump just in case uh, anything happened in your house, you 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 could use it. And of course, we had one uh, up on the upper floor in Osry Road. And uh, again, all these incendiaries were, were being dropped on a different night earlier. 
and uh, the warden came in uh, and said, has anybody got any stirrup pumps and that? And the old man said, yes, we've got one, and we've got sand and water. So he and I went out into the house to get it. And as we walked up the stairs, the flames were coming out of the bedroom door. And it had set light to the, to the paint on the outside of the door without actually setting light to the thing. And, of course, we went in the bedroom and uh, the incendiary bomb had come through. The fin was up in, stuck in the plaster lath. The bomb had, it, behind the bed. Uh, and, of course, it was a feather bed, so the smell was... The bed was alight. It had damaged the, the, um, the dressing table. Um, but, of course, instead of us taking the thing, I, 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 um, I was pumping the syrup pump and the old man was putting the fire out, which he did. Uh, I wasn't scared. Um, I suppose it's a character of mine in a way that if I'm faced with a problem situation, I'm very, pra very pragmatic and I will not panic, take it in my stride, analyse what the problem is and what I should do. I've, I, I suppose the thing I learned more than anything about the Blitz is the way people adapt. It is absolutely incredible. Right through the Blitz, we had no gas. So we didn't have a gas cooker. We had a gas cooker, but there's no gas. Um, everything had to be cooked in the in the oven. You did you you boiled your, your uh, in the in the old Victorian kitchen oven, and everything and you boiled your kettle on the hob outside, and you had no no gas at all. Um, but people adapted. When they're in the Anderson shelter, uh, if you're in there all night, those steel walls, the condensation would run down like anything. But in no time at all, and the shelters had floors in with lino and uh, an enterprising company produced anti-condensation paint and you would paint, yeah. It is quite amazing uh, the way people do adapt. And it could to me, mad on aeroplanes. I mean, it's all about aeroplanes. I knew all the aeroplanes. I knew the German, all the German planes, the Spitfires, the Hurricanes, the British planes. Uh, and I was absolute a fanatic on. I used to take the Spotter every week, which was the the, the airplane Spotter magazine. All the silhouettes. Now I I was mad on airplane. The interesting thing, of course, the Blitz stopped, and then these these lone bombers came over, and then that stopped. And of course, everybody then thought the bombing was over. But then, of course, in 1944, I think it was about June 1944, um, the first doodle bug as they were called, V-1 rockets. I can remember, in fact, hearing this plane and I got up and watched it go and I thought it was a plane on fire. But what I was seeing was the sort of jet propulsion bus name at the back. And of course it landed in Bethnal Green. And of course the government, although they knew all about V-1s, uh, uh, they tried to say it was a plane that crashed. But of course then two days later, uh, the V-1 rocket started. And of course I was at the School of Building at the time and of course when when you got to the school of building at uh, sort of nine o'clock and at 9 30 the air rain warning went because the v1s would start coming over for the first few weeks um, everything stopped and you went down in the basement nothing happened at all and then of course you realized that with v1s um, they were on a mechanical flight and they had a time on the time fuse on the uh, switch on the, the propulsion. And then the engine would cut out and it would glide down. You do see occasionally pictures of them going that. That's invariably when they've been shot down. They've gone. When they, what happened? Because they were natural, they would just glide down. And so you knew uh, very quickly that if you were out in the open and the V2s were coming over, if the V2 wasn't coming in your direction, the V1, sorry, wasn't coming in your direction, it wasn't your problem, it was fine if it carried on. But if it stopped, the engine stopped just there, that's when you died for cover. Uh, the, the old man had gone on war work, had uh, been sort of conscripted on war work to go out because he was too old to go in the army to go into service because he served in the First World War. and. Uh, uh, he, he was out in Suffolk building American Air, Air Force bases. Uh, he did the one at Leiston. And uh, my mother had, was supposed to do war work as well, but she had, 
I don't know whether... Jen, anyway, she had some sort of heart and she got her doctor to say that she shouldn't. So she had to do outwork. So she had to make iodine brushes. And they were... You've got quills, uh, feather quills. You boil those, which is a terrible stink. And then you wrap round the, the, the black thing and stuck them through with a needle. Uh, and she used to get paid... Uh, I think um, she used to get paid sixpence a hundred. I, and she used to get me doing them, at four, and, she, and she paid me fourteen four p a hundred. So, <laughs> so there were no no flies on my mother, and uh, but I used to have to go back to the factory in Nunhead every Tuesday afternoon. I would take the brushes that we'd made in, and then bring the fresh supply of the quills and that. And I'm on the bus coming back down Rye Lane, Peckham. I'm on the top deck, uh, and the, the bus windows all had the stick, but you had them wound down. And suddenly I saw and about half a dozen people on the top of the bus, and one or two of the others saw at the same time. Suddenly looked out the window, and this this B1 gliding down almost alongside us. And of course everybody dived under the bus. And it landed um, on Peckham Road, on what was a pig processing factory. It's the bus station now, right opposite the cinema, the Odeon. And, uh, of course, the buildings on Rye Lane and that protected us from the blast, so we didn't come to any damage. But i never forget that image of the, a close-up view of a V1 sort of gliding down alongside you. I mean, in a funny sort of way, I know this sounds strange, I have happy memories of the Blitz. Um, yes, it was scary, but boy, was it exciting. Of course, during the war, there was conscription and, and, and all FIP men went into the surfaces. When the war finished, they started demo demobilising very fast, but they still needed to keep the strength of the services up. So conscription continued much later uh, than, in fact, national service came in. And, of course, it, when I was uh, 18, I was working in my, still in my first architect's office, just beginning to get really organised in career and of course I got my conscription papers called up uh, at 18 so on September the 26th I think it was 1946 off I went to Maidstone uh, to join the army. At the end of the six weeks of course they had decided that as I was uh, an architectural uh, student um, I should go in the Royal Engineers. That was more or less the standard seat to become a sapper. So I then did this um, core training at the uh, at Guillemont Barracks down in uh, in Cove in Hampshire, which was um, very tough. You're in squads of 20. But you went through everything, booby traps. You knew how to lay booby traps. Um, watermanship, you rode... I mean, bridge building, uh, built Bailey bridges. I mean, it was a fantastic time. We had hand grenades, which were called Mills bombs, and those were a bit bigger than a cricket ball, and you pull the pin out, count ten, and throw it. And if you don't throw it when the ten is up, it explodes in your hand. So the moment you pull the pin out, you want to get rid of it. And, uh, of course, I could throw a cricket ball. I played cricket. I could throw a cricket ball uh, any reasonable distance without any problems at all. And, of course, I had the dummy throw of the Mills bomb with the, uh, 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 a dead one that wasn't live. No problem. I'm in the trench there with the sergeant and with our tin hats on and throw the, the Mills bomb, pull the pin out, throw it. Oh, it went about 20 yards. <laughs> Bang. And... Uh, the sergeant said to me, that wasn't very good, was it? <laughs> Greatest one of all was, of course, um, in the infantry training. They developed during the war a Sten gun, which was a very cheap metal automatic machine gun, really, but very cheap. Uh, so, But they, we were equipped, and that was for urban. We were fighting, close-cut fighting in urban areas. Uh, and uh, we were warned, you have you, know, you, you practice with them, we were warned that um, uh, sometimes the bullet came out of the ejector sign. So you, in fact, lined up in echelon so you didn't shoot the next guy if your bullet came out the wrong hole. Uh, and the other thing was, of course, that being a very cheap gun, it used to jam. And so, of course, the sergeant said to us all, if your gun jams, don't say, Sergeant, my gun's jammed and point the damn thing at me. And, of course, what happened? My gun jammed. I turned round. I said, Sergeant, my gun's jammed. 
I learnt more swear words in the next five minutes than I knew in my life. I mean, I did two years, just under two years. I finished up as chief leave and pay clerk in the army, which was uh, quite accidental. I'd learnt to type when I was in my first office. And because I was on draft, I was originally on draft to go to Palestine in 1947. And Palestine wasn't the place you wanted to go. The, the, uh, the Israelis, the Jews were blowing up St David's uh, Hotel. and so. But I'd had injured my finger in, in playing around with these 25-pounders. So when I went to, down to Woolwich Garrison... I I was on medical treatment, so I couldn't go. So I finished up being sent to the HQ troop to what I do a, a t- as a temporary leave and pay clerk. And uh, I was asked, can you type? And, of course, I could. So I got the job temporarily. At the end of the job, uh, <clears throat> yeah, they had to appoint, appoint a permanent leave and pay clerk for the whole garrison. Very key job, very important job. And... Uh, uh, and the sergeant major said to me, would you like it? And I said, well, you must be joking, Woolwich. I live just down the road. Um, and so I went. he sent me over with a canny old sergeant, Sergeant McFadden, who was uh, been around, knew everybody and really was canny. Took me over to the quartermaster to get signed on as the new chief leave and pay clerk. And when we got over there, the quartermaster said, you can't have him. To Sergeant McFadden, why not? Well, he's a he's a he's a qualified he's a marks first class marksman. But that doesn't matter. Not going to fire any guns. But he's a qualified RA surveyor and a battery surveyor. And the other surveyors that I'd learnt to be eight months specialist training on twenty five pounders and mortars. Um, and he said you can't because you don't have a compliment uh, for him. So the Sergeant McFadden, canny as he was, knowing the quartermaster was a very close friend, just said, give me the papers, signed away my eight-month specialist training side with just gunner Luda. But l- years later, the most amusing thing of all, of course, uh, we were redeveloping the Royal Artillery Barracks at um, Aldershot. And, of course, being the president of the RIBA and being their architect for their new barracks, I got invited to the real top regimental dinner, sitting alongside the chief gunner with all his red tabs. He said to me during the, during the dinner, you know, sort of, Luda, um, were you in the services? And, and I said, yeah, yes, I was in the artillery. Oh, yes, gunner. So I said, yes. He said, what rank? I imagine expecting me to say lieutenant, major, colonel, whatever. And I said, gunner Luda. Great conversation stuff, he didn't know how to talk to an ordinary gunner. Despite my two years in the army and that, I really was quite shy, uh, certainly with, um, with women. But I, of course, had good dance and I wasn't a bad dancer. And so the obvious thing was, and in those days, the only way you could get your arm around a girl was to take her dancing, by and large. And uh, <clears throat> so I, with friends and that, I would go dancing. went to the Locarno in Streatham, which was one of the top sort of dancing venues, certainly in South London. Uh, and, of course, there, there was the sort of ritual of the, of the lads and the, the girls, uh, they're there by themselves in what everybody, they described and we described as the sort of slave market. And, of course, you would go over and if you fancied to dance with a girl, then you went over and asked. And I, you, I was, in a way, so shy. I, I was dead nervous about being rejected. So I sometimes would go through a whole evening. And But I obviously, had, I went over to, and I can't remember exactly what happened. I must have gone over and I danced with Doris and then I had another dance. And uh, in no time at all, of course, uh, we had it, uh, talked about each other. And I arranged to meet her at um, uh, outside Tooting Broadway Station. The relationship developed fairly rapidly. We got on pretty well together. She was still living with her foster parents, and she'd had a very troubled um, childhood. Her mother had deserted and left her, and she was only 13. Then... Her father shacked up, married, eventually, I think, married another woman who had already got four children of her own. And then there were great problems, and quite obviously from what I know, and I don't know all the whole story, um, uh, Doris and, uh, and her two brothers were very much on the outside and badly treated. Whether she was abused, I don't know, but uh, I suspect, and uh, certainly my daughters all suspect, that that was a problem. 
we were both very instinctively family orientated we started a family uh, and that was you know quite a deliberate choice and of course Jacqueline Kim was the first daughter followed fairly quickly by by Kate by then I was getting quite successful and I managed to find a site in Hearn Hill to build out we'd been we'd living in a bed sit uh, in a bed sit in Clapham and then I managed to get a, a, a rooms in the same house as where I lived with the mother and father on the top. They were on the top floor and we were on the ground floor. That didn't help the relations between Doris and the mother, um, uh, which I'm pretty sure was more my mother's fault than Doris's. Um, but, but nevertheless, uh, I then, you know, we, I, we were going to get a family, uh, so I found this site and built this first little house for ourselves. A narrow fronted terrace house cost two thousand pounds. Uh, Jackie and Kate remember it well because their first uh, seven or eight years uh, of life were in that house, uh, and it worked very well. That's where I started my practice. All the time, wanting to prove our, our, our sort of the way our, our, our way of life where we lived and what we did. After 13 years, we decided to start a family again. And uh, both of us wanted a little boy. And of course, Peter arrived uh, in 1965. Uh, and we were both overjoyed. Uh, but of course, within a week, it had been established that he'd got a hole in his heart problem and was in Great Ormond Street Hospital. He had a palliative operation which uh, initially looked as though it was working but didn't, but of course he died within 10 weeks. Uh, so we lost Peter, Peter Owen Luda, as he was going, well, as he was christened. I mean, losing Peter was very difficult. And I can remember going into the chapel, and I'm not, I'm spiritual, but I'm not, uh, although probably I was closer then to sort of religion. Um, I went to the chapel and sort of just prayed. Doris and I had been in to see him, and he wasn't in. He was obviously struggling, and we came back, and then within, well, within a matter of a few hours, I got a phone call saying that uh, he would, it wouldn't be long. Would I, would I go back? And by the time I got there, of course, he died, uh, and the. I, I suppose it was understandable, but it, it was a bit harsh. The, the surgeon. Uh, who was in charge, the doctor in charge, sort of actually said to me, well, we would love to have the heart and organs and that. Would you consent to that? Now, um, that really was the wrong time to ask me, but nevertheless, I said yes. So what we buried, I'm not, not sure how much we buried of Peter, but nevertheless, uh, I don't have any regrets about that. It was just very difficult to be asked that question just at that moment. I met a very great friend, the, uh, somebody who became a very great friend, uh, Eric Stroud, who was the paediatrician. Uh, and uh, he was, he sort of, he was encouraged us both, both Doris and I. <coughs> I said, well, a bit like falling off a bike, you know. Um, I, I know you've had a terrible experience with losing little Peter, but um, why don't you carry on? You know, you intended to have another two, carry on. So we did, and Sarah, to great joy, Sarah arrived about a year after Peter died, and then, of course, uh, Judith arrived another 18 months, 20, nearly two years after that. I think I was as good a father as, you, as I could be, bearing in mind, at the same time, I was making a much better life for all of us, because, come what may, living in a luxury house with cars, going on luxury holidays, is damn sight better than living in the old Kent Road in rooms. I suppose that's what drove me on in a way as well. Did I love them as babies? Um, they were babies. They didn't have personalities. Um, I was reasonable. I mean, in those days, in the days when I had uh, daughters as young babies, uh, there weren't the pressures. You had to be present at the birth. At their birth, I wouldn't want to have been present at the birth because I think a woman having a baby is not. She is not looking her best, um, uh, and it may be so. I, I, you know, I didn't, and I, I, I wouldn't. I don't think I would now.
I think, if I remember right, it'd do my sort of reasonable share of changing nappies and that. But I wouldn't, it wasn't, it wasn't an occupation that I really, you know, I would do it because I really had to, I thought I had to. And I always say, children up to two years old, they, they, they are completely within your control. The moment they get to two, you are suddenly in their control. And that, of course, and then this, suddenly they become personalities uh, and their, their, their personality changes as they grow. And that's fascinating to see how they, how they grow up. And I think with, with girls particularly, how they then make that transition between being young children, giggling girls, rather serious teenagers, and then, of course, are grown-ups and get married and make a life of their own. That's fascinating. Uh, it was a very successful marriage in many ways. We progressed from having not two pennies to put together when we first got married. Uh, and as my practice grew and I grew in prosperity and that, um, life moved on. Uh, and, and Doris, of course, was part of that. And she thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, there's... I don't. You don't have to question the fact that she enjoyed living in a luxury house in Dulwich rather than uh, in Coldblow Lane by Millwall Football Ground. Um, uh, so the thirty years was a, in many ways, a very happy uh, family uh, time. The happiest times, I suppose, were when we had our first baby. That was something that was really, really great. Happy times also, of course, when the others arrived. But that first one is, is your first babe, your first child is, is very special. Uh, happy times um, on holidays when we would go on holidays as a family and we would you know, enjoy it as a family. And uh, happy times with Doris from that point of view. When we had the cottage at Swanage, uh, Swanage was a lovely place, always top of the Sunshine League. Um, and we would be there and, you know, living in the cottage, going down to the cottage and, uh, and being in Swanage, uh, doing surfing because it's uh, swimming. Great family holidays. And, of course, I'd grown up with a family holiday, not, well, as, a, as an only child. And I've got, you know, photographs of me on the beach sitting down by the pond I've made with the little boat. I mean, I continued the sort of life with my children that I'd had. Sarah's interest always was swimming. And, of course, now she's a champion long-distance swimmer. She swung from Istanbul across the Narrows in, in Turkey there. She swam from Sicily to Italy. And our last one was she swam from Gibraltar to Morocco. Now, that is great. Now, I'm, I was quite a good swimmer, but nothing like that. Nothing like that at all. The great thing I learned, of course, of my girls, they all swam. And, of course, you have races with your children and, of course, you always beat them until the day comes when they beat you. Then you stop having races with them. <laughs> Julius was a great horse rider. She, she loved, loved horses. But they did all the things. I mean, they joined the Brownies. In fact, the, when we were living in Herne Hill in the very early days, uh, Jackie and, and Kate uh, went to the, Sunday, the Salvation Army Sunday School and the great story was that, and it really was quite amusing, because my my love of cars, which was developing, and I was running a Ford Popular, which was the, really at the bottom of the range, but I'd set my mind on getting a Sunbeam Talbot. And the song that they used to sing from the Sunday school in the Salvation Army was a, trans, a slightly altered wording, my daddy wants a sunbeam. <laughs> we always treated birthdays so special. Of course, their 17th birthday was always very special because that's when they were then, all four of them, one after the other, had their, their birthday present, which was a driving course. And the moment they passed their their driving test and they could drive, they had a car, they had a Mini, uh, which of course in those, by that time I could afford. And that applied t to all four. And of course Jackie's favourite one was on her 21st birthday, I transferred, I changed the Mini to a, uh, an, M uh, an MGB, a yellow MGB, which she was very disappointed to have to give up when they started their family. <laughs> the great thing with Judith was the golf. Um, Judith was not particularly sports orientated, but when we were having a holiday down at Branksome Tower, beautiful hotel down in Bournemouth, 
demolished, now gone. And they had a championship nine-hole golf course. And I was quite keen. On, I was very keen on golf. And, of course, I played round. And I did... Uh, and Judith, when we got down there on this particular holiday, had said, Dad, I'd like, to, I'd like to play golf. And so I said, well, OK. And I took her around for a couple of rounds on that. And I said to her, you'd better have a, cu- a couple of lessons with the pro. So she had a couple of lessons with the pro. In the meantime, uh, I did a hole in one there. Now, it was a short hole course, but it's a whole one. And, of course, I, I you know, went back to the hotel and said to Doris, you know, I know, I know clever, I've done a hole in one. It was a jammy, lucky thing, but that's what all hole in ones are. Two days later, of course, Judith, who'd had these lessons uh, in golf and the golf pro, I take her out in the morning and we get to the top of the hill and it was a very dry dry summer that's how I did my hole in one very dry in summer and uh, she did this lovely little swing and the ball down the down the hill jumped over the hedge the, the ditch that was supposed to catch it rolled across the green went down in one and of course uh, the two old guys coming up behind us in their 60s who had played golf all their life never done a hole in one anyway they were almost crying at the sight and so of course I went back to the hotel I said Doris Judy's just done a hole in one. You know what Doris said to me? You told me it was difficult. <laughs> Actually it happened. My hole in one is registered, and so is Judy. She's got the hole in one goal. I mean, I accepted the fact that if you've got daughters, they would sooner or later have boyfriends. You hope they didn't make mistakes. You hope they didn't get involved with the wrong sort of people doing the wrong sort of things. But all you could do was have a watching brief. Hope for the best. I mean, I've been asked the question on on several occasions. Uh, you know, which is which of your daughters is your favourite? And I say, I don't have a favourite. I've got four daughters. They're all different. I said, I love them all in different sort of ways. Uh, uh, and you, your relationship uh, adjusts because they are different. I mean, I'm proud of all my four daughters. I mean, I'm finding it difficult to to find words to explain uh, what must seem to some people, why if it was so bloody good, how on earth did it finish? It finished in the end because there was nothing, there was no common interest in the marriage. But of course, I was growing up in a family of women. I don't know I was sort of conscious of that, but you know, the way things have been in my life, you know, I've had I had a mother to look after me. Uh, I've had two wives, um, and Doris was a very good one at looking after. Doris is a as a housewife, you know, as, as a mother, housewife, homemaker, absolutely first class, no question about that at all. Uh, and uh, and then of course I had four daughters, and then I've got granddaughters. So I've been surrounded by, which is one of the reason why is I can't cook. <laughs> Jackie is very very close. When I had my open heart surgery, she was the one that was there every day. She was the one that kept everybody informed as to what I... And, of course, for 12 days, it was touch and go. And I always say, well, I'm very pleased it was touch and I didn't go. She is very proud of her father. I know that from Mel, her husband, because his view is that Jackie, of all my four daughters, recognises more than any of them what, in fact, I achieved for them, that they benefit the way they benefit. Kate thinks the sun comes out of my backside. <laughs> That's possibly an overstatement, but, I mean, Kate and I have uh, uh, have a love affair I, in that sort of father and, and... And I've just said to her, because she helped me down here, and I thanked her, and she said... And she just did a text back to me and said, Dad, I helped you because I love you. So I just did a text back and said... Well, I didn't say this was a quote from Jackie, but Jackie always say, love in all its forms is a mutual admiration society. So with Kate, it's a bit of a mutual admiration society. Sarah is, um, if you ask Sarah, I'm sure she would say she's very proud of her dad. And I know that because I can remember in her early days as a lawyer, <coughs> and she was up in the, in the northwest somewhere, and somebody said to her, Oh, Luda, <coughs> do you know Owen Luda? And she said, and she told me this, and she said very proudly, Oh, he's my father. <laughs> and um, in her office in Slaughter and May, she's got a, a photographic reproduction of my. RIBA presidential portrait. Judith, very difficult because she is a very complex character. If you ask her at the wrong time, she would not be very complimentary. 
Um, if you ask her at the other time when she was, she would be over the moon. Um, uh, but I think even Judith would, would say, I hate my old man in some ways, but in fact, he, he wasn't too bad, really. I'm sure that's what she would say. I am at heart, despite my sort of, perhaps my business image of being a tough, tough cookie. I'm as soft as anything. I'm an old romantic. Um, I love nostalgia. I love going back over the, you know, past things. Um, my love for collecting models of cars I've had and aeroplanes that I would love to have flown. Uh, that's all nostalgia. So no, I know I'm a, I'm an old old old. I'm an old romantic at heart. Um, and in all my relationships with. Um, with women. I'm an old romantic. <laughs> I was born in Islington. My mother used to say, good old Arsenal. And so I became, I suppose, instinctively an Arsenal supporter from very young. But when I moved, we moved over to South London, uh, the first football team I ever saw was Millwall. Millwall were very close by. Uh, Doris's parents, uh, Doris's father, they're very close, Cold Blood Lane, very close to the Millwall ground. And so we used to wait. In those days, they would open the gates 20 minutes from the end to let the uh, early leavers go. And we used to bunk in to see the last 20 minutes. And I remember seeing the last 20 minutes of their Millwall's Cup, Cup semi-final in 19... 19- 38 and they had a very good team then um, so in a way Millwall was the local club but it was still Arsenal when I was um, when I, I would have been 12 13 I was allowed to go to my first football match by myself and I got the tram down uh, to uh, Woolwich uh, uh, to, to Charlton but on, the, on the way to Woolwich uh, to see Charlton play Arsenal and this was October the 16th, 1941. I, I could remember it was October, but I, I've got a book which gives us all the records, so I know it was October the 16th. And Arsenal won 3-1. Uh, I can tell you the Arsenal team, it was virtually the pre-war uh, team, all the old stages. Uh, the, most of the Charlton team, I can tell you, because they were their cup-winning team. And in those days, you used to stand <coughs> behind the goal that Arsenal was shooting in, and then at half-time, you'd jump over the little gate, walk round, and go at the other end, so that that, of course, doesn't happen these days. But So that was when I first saw them, and then I followed them right through the war, and they played when they played at White Hart Lane, because Arsenal uh, Stadium, Arsenal uh, Highbury, was requisitioned and then bombed. The North Bank was bombed. So they, they played all their wartime games at, uh, at White Hart Lane. So I've been to White Hart Lane more times than some Chelsea, some uh, Spurs supporters. I saw them play Moscow Dynamo at White Hart Lane immediately after the war. Uh, and then, of course, once the war started, I by then I was absolutely committed. In 1963, I decided I would like to buy a share, some shares in Arsenal, for no other reason than to get a share of the football club I loved. And of course it takes you to the AGM, to the AGM and, and you're really part of the club. So I advertised in, I think it was the Daily Telegraph, I had every football journalist in the land contacting me thinking I was trying to take over Arsenal. This is 1963. And I said, no, all I want is... the. Anyway, I had the offer of 12 shares, 10 from one and two from another. And I bought 12 shares at £10 each in 1963. I, in fact, sold uh, 10 of them off over the years as they increased in value. And I didn't buy them to increase in value because I only needed one. So I had two. When I married Jackie, I said to Jackie... Would you like one of my Arsenal shares? By then she was you know, an Arsenal supporter. So I gave her and I said, this is really love and, uh, and dedication. I said, you've got one of my Arsenal shares. So she had one and I had one. Within six months, they did what's called a, se- a script issue. Seven shares for every one. So she had eight shares, I had eight. I gave one of my shares to Jackie, my oldest daughter, who was a confirmed gooner. One to Sarah, my third youngest daughter, uh, who also was a... Arsenal supporter. I groomed them well, those two. And I had six and Jackie had eight. Uh, over the years, we've obviously had our ups and downs. We Football, as far as I'm concerned, is great fun. It's enjoyment. If your team wins, you're on cloud nine. If they lose, you're pretty miserable. 
But I, I mean, when that Arsenal, they say, stand up all those that hate Tottenham. I don't stand up. I don't hate Tottenham. I just, I'm just very pleased when they lose. It's just a game. It, you know, I've, and I've always seen it that. But no, I've seen all the great players. I remember seeing Liam Brady come on as a substitute and thinking, boy, that young lad has got it. I saw Vieira come on as a, Patrick Vieira come on as a substitute at Highbury. And straight away, you could see this guy was a footballer. Um, and, uh, you know, the because in the early days, you couldn't get to, to Wembley to see Arsenal, to see the cup final. And it wasn't even on television. And so I remember you know, the 1950 cup final, listened to it on the radio. Uh, the 1951, uh, when we lost to Newcastle, very unluckily. But, of course, when we got through to 1970, we were playing Ipswich in the cup final. And that was the cup final, the first one I went to. But I had just introduced Sarah. She was sitting in, the seat next, in my other seat. And she became a gooner in 1970. And that first season, we went to Wembley 1-0, lost 1-0. Next season, we went back to Wembley. We beat Man United 3-2 with a great last-minute goal. And Liam Brady was very much involved in it. And then the following season, third season that Sarah had been a supporter, we were beaten by West Ham. Uh, the headed headed goal. That. The fourth season, we were knocked out in the semi final. Sarah said to me, "Dad, we're not going to Wembley this year." And I said, "You don't know how lucky you are." I said, "You've supported the team for four seasons. You've been to Wembley three times already." Most football supporters in those days never get to Wembley in their life. Laconia was the Greek line, and of course, when we first went on, uh, it, they had not quite finished all the work, so when we were on, they were still doing some finishing touches. We did, in fact, have a lifeboat drill, but lifeboat drills, uh, my experience is, lifeboat drills are not important from the point of view of passengers, not really. Um, they're important that the crew know what to do. Anyway, we, we were sailing, we, were, we had booked this as a special Christmas. We were sailing from Southampton to Madeira, uh, where we'd been before. Uh, at Fork, and we were going to have Christmas at, uh, at the Savoy in, in Madeira, which was the second best hotel. Reeds is the two, super one. And we were going to have Christmas there. And then the, the, the Coney was going to pick us up on the way back and we would have New Year on the ship on the way back. Uh, well, on the, uh, it would have been uh, December the 22nd, we're all in the, in the dance in the evening, uh, and it's the tramps party, and the girls were in fancy dress, and this is Jackie and, and, and Kate, who then were nine and ten, that sort of age. And there's a photograph that we got from the mirror, the Daily Mirror, which they had nicked from, they'd got from somebody, which actually was showed the, the, the choir, the children's choir, which the minute. And of course, everything was going fine until I'm, we're sitting at a table just near one of the companionways. And I suddenly saw smoke coming up the companionway. And of course, I called out that, and that was the start of it. And that was 9.30 on that evening. Um, and of course, it wasn't really, I mean, for a start, we were sent down below. Quite frankly, the last place you want to be if you're on a ship that's on fire is down below. You want to be on the deck so you can get off the ship if you have to. Anyway, they, obviously nobody believed. I mean, what we found out afterwards, I mean, it was totally mismanaged. There was a fire started in the hairdressing salon and fire is generated by oxygen. At the moment they broke the door of the hairdressing salon down, the air rushed in and woof, the whole thing went up. And so by uh, within an hour, we were up from down below the thing. We walked through the cinema and people thought we were, it was the fancy dress with us with our night jackets on. And uh, anyway, we were on deck and where we were standing in our thing, um, there was a little boy that had been... Um, trapped in the cabin they couldn't get to the cabin and they got him they went over the side and got him out through the porthole uh, and we saw all this happen and he, he was saved from there sadly he was in the lifeboat in front of us which tipped up as it was then he was lost so he was saved from the fire and lost lost in the sea but by 12 o'clock the fire was clearly out of control the 
public address system had broken down. The crew on the face of it didn't really know what the hell to do. But there was uh, the cruise director, uh, who was absolutely first class, he took over. And uh, he, it was he who um, was up on deck. And when, they, when the captain said, well, the lifeboats will go away, but we better get people off the boat because it is on fire and it's a serious fire. So the, the, the lifeboats, um, and we were at our lifeboat station. The girls, Doris and the girls, got into the lifeboat. I should have followed them, but I'm standing there, British, good old British, what's name, women and children first, thinking of the, of, the, of the Titanic. But of course, it wasn't like that at all. I mean, there was more than enough lifeboats for everybody. And there was no reason I was supposed to be in the lifeboat. And the lifeboat was level with the top of the rail. And the girls, Doris and the girls, were shouting at me to join them. And at the last minute, I went into the lifeboat. Had I not have done so, of course, I would have been on the, and it would have been quite a different outcome. Most frightening thing was, as the lifeboat is lowered, the sea, the, the ship is rocking because it's a fairly heavy swell. And of course, the lifeboat was crashing against the side of the ship as we were going down. And these were old clinker lifeboats, uh, timber ones. And of course, hadn't been in the water and that was one of the things that was wrong they hadn't tested them in the water and of course when they hit finally hit the water they let water in through the to the to the tempest as well but as we were going down that was the time i just didn't think that the lifeboat would be strong enough to withstand this crash and indeed the lifeboat in front of us had already tipped over they tried to free the divots and they freed uh, they'd all stuck up with paint and they managed to clear, they cleared one end of the divot and not the other. And the lifeboat just tipped half of the people in, into the water. And that's where they lost the little boy. Um, anyway, by that time, I, we didn't really, I didn't have time to think about that. I mean, I saw it, but it, that, wasn't, that wasn't our problem sort of thing. Our problem was just banging against the side. Anyway, we hit the, hit the water. They managed to free the divots and we dropped. Because as you get, you get about three or four five feet away from the water and then you free it and then the, the lifeboat dropped into the water and as we floated away from the laconia in the lifeboat a great gush of flame came out of the side of the laconia and i thought yeah that's it we're in the right place here there must have been about i think about 30 people in the lifeboats if i remember rightly there were two crew and the two crew we had were were pretty good one was in bailing out uh, they were sensible enough to realize there was no point in in rowing People were reacting quite differently. Um, some were shouting out. Um, I mean, others were very quiet. Um, I mean, I'm a, that sort of person. In those circumstances, I'm quiet. I don't talk. I'm sitting there thinking and you know, weighing up whatever it may be. Uh, but some very talkative. Um, some every now and again shrieking and... and you know, all the all the emotions you would expect from thirty different people suddenly put into that situation. You know, people started shrieking with the water coming in, and then uh, people were saying, "Well, you know, let's row, let's row." And I thought, "Well, where the hell are we going to row? It's about two hundred, it's two hundred, one hundred eighty miles to Madeira, and about two hundred fifty miles to Morocco. Where are we going to out the main object? Stay afloat." But certainly, you see. You know, when you're in a lifeboat um, and you see the ship that you were on with all your belongings, it didn't have anything uh, anything other than what we stood up in. Uh, and when you see that, you realise how unimportant material things in life you, you're in a lifeboat. Um, Jackie was with Doris. Uh, Doris um, uh, had a great fright. She had a great thing about mice and rats. I don't like rats, but I'm not that... You know, they're, they're rats. But she fished out, she had a, a handbag had dropped into the bottom in the water. She fished around and, and brought out a dead rat. <laughs> so, but I mean, that was, that was a minor. I mean, whereas that would have been a major in that. Um, uh, Kate was with me. Now, Kate, my second daughter, was very, very, very quiet. And I thought, I don't think she real because she's only, she's only nine. Uh, and I thought, I don't think she realises, um, you know, we really are in danger here. We've got out of the main danger, but we're still very much in danger. And then suddenly she had said to me, you're looking up at the stars and that, and she started talking about the various stars and that. And then suddenly she said, Dad, 
I'm so pleased we're together because if we're going to die, I want to die together. Absolute heart-rending stuff, but all in the middle of this. But we were in the lifeboat then right through the night um, uh, until 8 o'clock in the morning. We saw the uh, one of the, the rescue ships, the Montcalm, come up, uh, but didn't come in our direction. We were drifting down, um, and that went across the, the way we were drifting. And uh, we saw that come up, and, you know, the lights of that ship. We also saw the lights on the back of the Laconia, where those that had stayed on board were there. And what I learned afterwards, I mean, they were enjoying themselves in the bar at the end until, of course, they got to about half past five in the morning and the captain said, look, the fire is getting near the, 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 the diesel tanks. He said, you've got to get off because the ship could blow up. So that's when they all pitched fork, they had to pitch fork off. All the lifeboats had gone by then, and um, so there were no lifeboats. And so they literally pitched off in the water with their life jackets. And life jackets are lifesavers. I saw people, I saw a, uh, an old guy uh, in his mid-70s who was on the cruise for, as a convalescent, um, fished out of the water in his life jacket, and he lived. Anyway, we drifted down suddenly saw this liner coming up, this ship coming up, everybody shouting out. And we thought the liner hadn't seen us, but in fact, this is by this time, this is by now, just getting light, about seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, we thought it hadn't seen us, all shouting and flashing torches. And, but in fact, what it was doing, it, was, it had stopped a little bit further on, and then it was catching all the lifeboats as they came down uh, for us to climb out. Now, I can manage heights, but I'm not comfortable with heights. I, I mean, I, I manage them. I'm not, you know, it doesn't frighten the life out of me, but I don't like heights. And as for climbing rope ladders up the side, 90 feet up the side of a liner. But of course, that's what it was. And the interesting thing was, of course, everybody was absolutely tense. And the, but there was a baby. And they sent the bosun's cradle down for the baby, put the baby in the cradle. And it went up, of course, they got the searchlights on the ship all on us. And the baby going up, was just like a spider being taken up. And of course, everybody laughed. It broke the ice. And then of course, it was a case of children, children first, then women. And Sarah and, uh, and Jackie and Kate went up the rope ladder. Uh, and then of course, Doris. Uh, Doris by now had also dropped her handbag again. Uh, but she got in, she was, I, I mean, I can't think of anything that would have scared her more than having to climb up a, a rope ladder, but she did. But her words to me as she was getting out of the lifeboat, getting on the rope ladders, find my handbag, can you, can you, Harry? Because that's what she would know me as. And so I fished around, found her handbag. So when it came to my turn, I was one of the last to come out. There's me climbing up the ladder. Not very easily, because there's a secret way, there's a way of climbing. If you do it the wrong way, it's, it's doing this. Uh, and they're shouting out to me. And so when I hit the deck, I'm sure they must have wondered what they were getting with this guy coming up <laughs> with a handbag over his arm. Um, I remember everything, and I wrote it all down until I hit the deck. And for the next half an hour, I don't remember anything. It's a complete blackout. And then I woke up a half an hour later. I came to a half an hour later, uh, found myself sitting in a, in a lounge with a cup of coffee in front of me, drank the coffee, went out on the deck, and saw the more of the lifeboats, people coming, uh, being coming off the lifeboat, and they were cutting their life jackets off as they, as they got on the deck. And I thought, well, I better get rid of mine. I still thought I'd got my life jacket on, and they they cut it off obviously the moment I hit. And it was really like hell let loose. I mean, the the sea, the sh the sea around the Salter was the the Laconia was on fire and on the horizon. The sea around the Salter was dotted with bodies, um, live people in in uh, in life jackets, um, and I mean, and also the American Air Force had sent out these planes out from the Azores, and they were dropping uh, inflatable dinghies for people. And then I, I then suddenly thought, where's Jackie and Kate and Doris? And of course, I then discovered they were sitting in the in in, in the main lounge, alongside a, uh, a Portuguese family, very poor Portuguese family. Uh, and of course, I start that article that I wrote. Why don't daddies cry? That was Jackie. 
that was her words to me as I walked across. Uh, daddies do cry, <laughs> but not always. Um, and yeah, I'm quite emotional now. Um, but the great thing about a thing like that is stay together if you can. I saw couples that have been and families that have been sped up and one wife who couldn't find her husband. I mean, in the end, he, he, he died and he was being buried in Gibraltar. And she didn't know that until she got back to, to England. So it was, um, it's an experience you wouldn't want to wish on anybody. You wouldn't want to go through it. But having said that, it's a, a very salutary, I think you learn something in life. I had never believed that material things, that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, material things of money are there to be used. Uh, if you've got enough to do what you reasonably want to do, you're very comfortable. Um, uh, but believe me, you're in that situation. And also the other thing is, old Rudyard Kipling, if you keep your head around you, he's absolutely right. It doesn't mean to say you won't survive, because if fate has it, God, fate, whatever has it, that you aren't going to survive, you won't. But if you keep your wits about you, don't lose your head when all around you. Yeah, the old saying, if you, if you don't lose your head, you don't understand the nature of the problem. Um, now, keep, your, keep thinking. If you can, don't panic. Keep, keep thinking clearly. Um, uh, and above all, um, don't panic. And, but it's an experience. Uh, I can't say I'm, I, I'm glad I went through it, but it, I don't think it did any harm. Jackie first came to Larne uh, when she, in 1962 with her mother. And she, being a librarian, very much into literary and poetry, although she was quite young, she was very much into Dylan Thomas. And she came and she looked, on her own words, she looked up and said to her mother, one day I'll own a house up on that cliff top. And many years later, of course, she did with me. She was the information manager of, for the Greater London Council Architect Department, which was the biggest architect's office in the country at the time. Very important. But she was very much in the public sector. Um, I met her. There was chemistry. We obviously had a lot of common interests in that. She was very attractive, very bubbly, projected herself very well as a, as a woman. Fascinating, and when she first met me, and she was introduced because she didn't didn't know me, she was with a um, friend of hers, Claire Frankel, who would have been the first should have been the first woman architect of the RIBA, and she said to Claire, "Well, that's Owen Luder over there," and, and Claire said, "Yeah, well, I'll introduce her." So she brought uh, Jackie over, and we started ch chatting, and we clicked it straight away, because we had a lot of common interests. And after about five minutes, she said, because I was wearing one of my notorious, large, colourful bow ties. And she said to me, do you tie that bow tie yourself? So I said, of course I do. And she said, so she untied it and said, well, um, show me, which I did. That started, um, you know, a, a relationship. Uh, at first, it was, of course, um, very much professional uh, in, in a way that we had very much joint interests. But of course, it very quickly developed and uh, we became lovers. We started coming to Larn for holidays. We would come down because of the distance from London. We would come down for at least a week, possibly two weeks sometime. And we would hire a chalet up in the <clears throat> what was then Larn Park. Now it's Seasons. Um, and <clears throat> we knew the chalets that had the, the uninterrupted view through the trees of this magnificent estuary. Um, Dylan Thomas's heron priested shore uh, with the herons and and it was I found it totally fascinating it's an ever-changing kaleidoscope of light shade sun water smooth as a mill pond reflecting the sky or rough as anything with the wind whipping it up and the ebb uh, uh, the, the tide ebbing and flowing backwards and forwards I found that I mean, fascinating but also, of course, in no time at all, I found Larne itself as a town was fascinating. It's a different world. And Jackie and I used to come down, and a number of times Jackie would say, it could only happen in Larne, that sort of place. Three miles off, from, off the main road from St. Clair, and you're in a different world. Dylan Thomas said, 
I got on a bus to Laon and I never got back on again. Uh, and that is Laon. That's the effect it has on you. It's eccentric. It's different. It's beguiling. It's all of those things. And it's beautiful. It's such a switch off. And I think that was the thing with Jackie and I. Apart from the Dylan Thomas connection and everything else, it is a great place to totally switch off. We would come down to switch off from our busy, busy, busy life in London. And the time we spent uh, in Lahn together is rather special. As a lover, she was the most feminine feminist I've ever met. She was a real feminist. She, she was a glass, sing, a glass ceiling girl. And boy, did her career, she was a career girl. We had so much in common. Obviously, the, there was the problem of what would my family, how would my family relate to this? Um, initially, of course, they were varied. But in the end, of course, all of them, because Jackie was the sort of person she was, um, always ready to help anybody, uh, totally outgoing, always smiling. In the end, she was accepted, and all the girls came to her funeral. Uh, and indeed, Sarah uh, read out at the funeral service, the piece of poetry that's on the on the tombstone. We had a little dog called Charlie, a little Westie, who became a total part of our life uh, and sadly died when he was 15, literally only a few weeks before Jackie was diagnosed with the brain tumour. She was diagnosed in, in March 2000 and, uh, 2007 and uh, by August, September, I mean, we were being told that um, it was terminal. After she died, I mean, not only did I discover all the cards and poetry I'd written to her, and, because she kept them, and I kept hers, so we got a total collection. I also found a diary, which was fascinating, uh, and she really was in love by a diary, which was a great relief. And one of the pieces of poetry I wrote subsequently, grieving poetry, was and it's apposite to anybody who's been with somebody very close to them, very close to them when they've actually died. And the opening verse is, I was with you when your end was nigh. The room was quiet. Why did you have to die? I lost the love of my life, which is very, very sad. Just after she died, I discovered a little notebook where she'd written down all the medication because she was very organized. And in the back of it was a message. Owen, thank you for all those marvelous years. <laughs> Can't say any more than <laughs> We had a beautiful, loving, close relationship, which had fun, which at times were very serious. One of the great things, of course, and this is really a key, we had a lot of common interests, but equally well, where we didn't have common interests, when we went to Brighton and I went in the water and swam and she couldn't swim, she learned to swim. When I said to her, do you follow football? You ever been to a football match? And she said, Oh, a boyfriend took me to Chelsea once. I said, no, you've been to a football match because Chelsea were a joke in those days. She immediately started coming to football. You know, here I now, seven, over seven years since she died, and I still talk to her. <laughs> yeah, what more can I say? <laughs> what more can I say? I love you as I do. <laughs> I never lived alone. I'd always lived with somebody, surrounded by, usually surrounded by women. Um, I'd had this enormously close relationship. It couldn't be closer uh, with Jackie. Uh, and suddenly, and it takes quite a time to adjust. I mean, quite apart from the, the actual grieving, just adjusting. But of course, I'm no cook being surrounded by women. <coughs> I have no idea how to cook. I've always been a need to know 
I've never needed to know because I've had a mother. The army looked after me when I was in the army. I had four, uh, <coughs> and uh, Jackie who was a great cook, and I had four daughters. And then, and of course, when I suddenly wanted to start cooking, and I had to phone one of my daughters. I had a crash course how to use a microwave, <coughs> and then the first time I used the oven, I had to phone one of my daughters and said, "I'll just switch the oven on. Uh, it's only pumping out hot air." She said, have you switched the timer on? I said, well, do you have to? She said, of course you do. I said, oh, I haven't thought of it. <laughs> but it's taken me seven years to, 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 to work up the courage to break an egg on the end of a, edge of a frying pan to have fried eggs. But I could do bacon butties. When Jackie died, of course, I didn't come to learn anything like as often because I found the house very difficult by myself. So I have always, as long as I, as much as I can, encouraged to be here with people, which is why I have these posse of ladies that have been with me, all innocent, I might say. Um, but of course, it's the talk of Narn. I mean, has got another girl with him in, in Craggy Don, because here they, they know what you're going to do before you've even thought about it. Um, it's that sort of small community. But it's a magic place, um, and it's a place where and I now want to, of course, having built the extension, and I've built the extension, I suppose one of the main driving forces uh, was because I wanted to be able to come to Lyle and not have to live in that shadow, Jackie. Whenever I go into that sun lounge and there's the orange egg chair, that's where Jackie sat, where she was very ill, and that's where she sat and wrote that little note to me. So the extension, and I want to write... I'm trying to extract myself from, because I've done a lot of writing and I, 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 I want to write the autobiography. Uh, I want to write a steamy novel about architects because I know where the bodies are buried. I want to write more poetry. And this is the place to do it. And then this extension, which will be stunning. But also, Craggy Don is such a treasure in its own way and so unique. And Lan is as well that I want to leave Craggy Don as a, uh, to the family as a legacy, that they will be able to use it and enjoy Larn and enjoy this part of Wales, which is, which is great. The great thing, I think, is that all of us want to be remembered. Um, you know, my close family, my children and even grandchildren probably, they know quite a bit about me, but they don't know everything. Uh, but my great, great, great-grandchildren, when I'm gone, they will see this film of me and they will be able to see the sort of person I was and what I achieved. And they'll probably think, what an idiot. <laughs>
When I was a kid, I went to New Cross Speedway and uh, mixed with the Speedway riders, and it was fascinating. And then they restarted after the war, and I went after the war to New Cross uh, the Speedway. Uh, and I had this fascination of speed before the war with the world land speed records, Malcolm Campbell and that. So, And that probably led me on then also in the early 60s to kart racing when uh, it was very much an embryo sport uh, and very unofficial. We had an unofficial um, karting team, international, English international team. We raced in Belgium, in the Channel Isles, in France. Um, great, great times. Uh, and, but... Uh, they were all lightweights. They were jock like jockey weights, and I was heavy. So I never really had any great success because I carried too much weight. Having said that, I did come sec second in one race and was busy standing by my cart, taking off my helmet and then my red driving overalls. And that and this little lad comes running over and says, Mr, 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 can I have your autograph? And I signed his autograph. And he looked at it and said, oh, no, I didn't want your... And I wanted the guy that won the race. I love driving fast cars. My early cars obviously weren't fast. The first car I had was Sunbeam Talbot, which was a beautiful car. First car I drove 100 miles an hour in, uh, in the days when there were no speed limits. Um, and I, the Aston Martin DB6, which was the Bond car, was the best car I've ever had. I love speed. I had three Bristols, uh, Bristol Bowfighters, which were superb cars, enormous engines, very, very fast. Do I keep to the speed limit? What I say to my kids, behave yourself, um, but don't get caught. I am basically a loner. I, I work by myself. And loners probably aren't team people. But I'm a team player as well, and I proved that. I was asked to go on... I was on a board of a public, public company um, uh, way back in the 70s. Uh, but when Paris Moedi, who is an Iranian, but I'd known for years in here... When he became the chief executive of Jarvis, which was a bombed-out construction company, he asked me if I would join the board as an non-executive director, and I agreed. And I was on the board of Jarvis, which was an enormous success. Shares went from zero to being the, 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 the most valuable construction company in the business. Uh, back being involved in railways, back to a, uh, well, a, dis a, a disaster situation. You know, the, the Potter's Bar crash didn't help. But what, that, what I think I proved to myself and proved to other people that by being a non-executive director on a board of a public company, you have to be a team player. You can't be an individualist. You may have an individual view, but you've got to be a team player. So I do have, and of course, when I... When I was president, I became president because of my individual approach, my publicity, ability to, to promote myself, all of those things, which comes naturally. Um, to get that, to win that election, that was very much a one-off individualistic thing. But once you're president, you're the chair, effectively, of the team. And you've got to put it together a team and you've got to be a team player. So I'm a team player. And that is important. When necessary, you've got to be a team player. I remember reading a quotation. I can't remember who would have said it. Integrity is not only good sense, it's good business. I've always worked with integrity. I don't... You know, I, 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 I have a, a business philosophy. There are things I do. There are people I would work for and people I would not work for. Um... Uh, and it's a question of judgment. Maybe it's because growing up in the old Kent Road, from the start, I became very streetwise. Um, but you, you have to have, uh, I wouldn't say morals, you've got to have a set of principles when you're running a business. And any business, the culture springs from the top. If you're the boss, what you do goes right the way down the organisation. If the top is corrupt... Everybody else is corrupt. If the boss is getting away with it, they can get away with it. So you set an example, and I've always tried to... But, but consciously, I've always felt... I mean, I've worked in the commercial development. I mean, I had a feel for property. I made more money out of property than I made out of practising as an architect. I had a very good living, very, very good living uh, uh, as an architect. But by and large, 
property. And because I had a feel of property, the, the quotation of the fact that I'm, as an architect, I had a very plastic sense of, of, uh, of design, but equally well, the thing that the commercial developers liked about me was that I understood commercial development. I could walk down a high street and tell you roughly what the shop rents were likely to be, what the office rents, and of course the combination of the two. So I don't have any problems. Commercial, you know, the commercial world is the commercial world. But if you want to survive in it and you want to have a, a, a live with your conscience in it, you have to have integrity and integrity. I don't think any, I don't know anybody that can say ever about me. Owen, he pulled a fast one on me. I've never done that. Doesn't mean to say I haven't beaten them. That's a different question. How would I like to be remembered freshly? I was the engineer of change, both in architectural design, where I certainly laid the foundations of the way architecture developed from the 60s onwards, that I had a love of my profession and I wanted to make sure that it was a profession that was able to produce its best which is one of the reasons why I went out all my professional life, and certainly when I was president, to promote architecture and get people to understand architects and what architecture is all about. I've been president of the RIBA twice. I'm still not really accepted as a member of the establishment. Uh, I can remember when I was elected first time, one fairly eminent architect I heard say, What's this guy who designs high-security prisons and coal mines doing being president of the RIBA? I don't think the establishment, in the terms of the establishment of the profession, uh, have ever quite recognised um, what I contributed, what I have contributed. And I was always a radical for change. I've, cha I've helped change the profession to what it is today. In 1960s, I was saying architects should limit their liability and I was being ridiculed and abused and shouted at and told I got it all wrong. Find me today a practice that operates without limited liability. The buildings I produced in the 60s were, in fact, a great influence on what has come afterwards. And, in fact, Michael Heseltine actually said this. After, when I was past president, first after, I was at a dinner sitting on one of the tables as a past president, and he, he was the guest of honour, and he came over and said, Owen, he said, I don't think your profession have recognised what you've done for your profession. And that was the greatest accolade I could get from somebody like him particularly. As you get older, you become, at least I have certainly, become more emotional uh, because you're living through life. You have memories, you have great memories, you have uh, ordinary memories and you have sad memories. Uh, and I've had them all. Um, maybe I've had more of the better ones, but nevertheless. And, um, and I think as you get older and certainly nostalgia, nostalgia of thinking about and enjoying your past is great. And it does bring great enjoyment, but also can bring tears to your eyes. Inevitably, if you are starting as I did, from nowhere, with nothing, um, and you build a career, uh, and at the same time you've got a young family, you can be a family man full time, or you can develop a career as I did. How would I like my family to remember me by? Uh, they will have to make their own minds up. But as a loving father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather. <laughs> Being an only child, uh, I love my family. I mean, it's growing. We're now on number 29 on my birth family birthday list. It's growing. I love them all. They're all different. Uh, uh, right through from daughters, right through to grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and now great-great-grandchildren. So I, I love them all. I find them, again, you know, they are individuals, they're people, but they're people that are very close to me, so I'm even more interested in, in them. They're all different, and I, I love them. With the number, I never get time, I don't get sufficient time to be with all of them all of the time, obviously but I always enjoy spending time with my family. I find it very difficult to be religious in the sense of the Church of England and, and Christian religion, where we are told God is that 
great overbearing power that's looking after us all. Well, he isn't looking after those poor buggers in Syria and in, in, in Tunisia. Uh, and he, he, he didn't look after Jackie. Um, so I still have a spiritual values. But in any event, religion, uh, religion is every race in human race, every, every, every stage in the human race, whoever they are, they have always been trying to explain the unexplainable, infinity, something that goes on forever and ever. Everything we know has a start and a finish, a morning and an evening, a night and a day, a birth and a death, everything we know. So we try and put an explanation on it. And all those religions, at any, any time in, in mankind's time, all of those religions try to put an explanation. Now, there is probably some overpower overpowering, overriding power up there. But I find it difficult to believe that he's a god in the way that the Christian religion tried to, to project as being looking after us all and being the father and that Christ is the saviour. I just think of those that haven't been saved. People probably looking at me think, what a lucky guy, he's got everything. Foot, foot loose and fancy free, doesn't have any commitments. He must have everything. But, and also, of course, as you get old, you have enormous advantages of being old. You have experience and you have confidence. As you get, you know, the combination of experience and confidence are two things that go together. And the older you get, certainly if you've been successful, you have those two things in, in abundance. What do I miss most of all? What am I, what, what am I missing? And it isn't something that can be given to me as a present at Christmas or on my birthday. What I miss is that close intimacy I had, particularly with Jackie, uh, which I miss, which is when you've been out, you've had a marvellous evening out together, you come back and you have a final drink, uh, you go to bed, you have pillow talk, maybe you make love, um, and that doesn't happen. I can go out... And I have quite a social uh, a group of uh, social group of friends, lady friends. I go out, I enjoy company with them. We go to the theatre, I have a meal. But then there's the vacuum. They go home, I come home to my lovely flat, and I'm by myself. And that's what I miss more than anything. How I solve that, I don't know. <laughs> Secret of life is being ahead of the game thinking ahead, anticipating what is likely to happen. Um, no question about that at all. Uh, the lucky people in life are those that see the opportunities and grasp them. The unlucky people are those that, if they do see the opportunity, they don't have the courage or the wit able to grasp them. I've had such a successful career um, that it's very difficult to look back and say, well, um, I got that wrong, or yes, of course, have things you get. The principle of life is if you get something wrong, the moment you realise you get it wrong, put it right. So many people don't. They just sort of stare at it like rabbit in the headlights and don't do anything about it. Of course, it gets worse. And so the philosophy has always been, both uh, business-wise and uh, in life generally, that if, in fact, I realise that I've made a mistake or I'm going down the wrong track, then stop, think it through, put it right. Enjoy life. You only get one, so enjoy it while you've got it.